Welcome to Chapter 10, Motion. Um, this is Mrs. LaPenta, and I thought I would just spend a couple minutes going through Chapter 10 with you and going through the PowerPoint. This chapter is all about motion, and I like the picture at the very top there because it kind of shows us motion. You can see the dancer as she goes through all of the different parts of her leap and all the different motions that she's making. So we notice that that is motion. When we start to talk about motion, we need to think about it. How do we really know something is moving? In the picture down there, you see the hot air balloon, and you see that the background has kind of stayed the same, but we notice that the hot air balloon has moved. We notice that it's moving because of that background, because we have a reference point. And a reference point is needed in order to point, make in order for us to know that there was a motion that occurred. We need to see motion in order to realize that its motion is going. So we need to have a point of reference that's usually stationary so that we can see the motion occurring. So that's our reference point, but not only do we need to know a reference point or have a reference point, we also need to know how far the object traveled. So, you know, did it did that um, object stay in place? Did it move? Okay, and when we start to figure out the motion and we start to figure out how far the object traveled, what's the distance that it traveled, what direction it traveled, because we're going to be talking about all of those different things, we can start to get a feel and we can start to really describe what motion has occurred. Another thing your textbook talks about is displacement. And when we talk about displacement, you really need to think about is the sp starting point and the ending point. And pretty much just take a single straight line from the starting point to the ending point. And that is the displacement. That has to include a direction as well. So we need to know in which direction um, the displacement occurred. And displacement is usually going to be shorter than the distance that you traveled. As you see down here, I have a nice little diagram here. Here's the starting point. And if this person's, you know, taking a nice little hike through the woods and they follow the path, the path takes them up and winds them all around and we end here. That would be the distance that was traveled would be this nice little purple line. But if we look at this displacement, here's the starting point, here's the ending point, here's my single straight line. Notice the displacement is different. And notice also that the displacement has an arrow point at the end. And that's because it has to have that direction. Speed. Everybody likes speed, right? So speed is a measure of how fast an object's going. Um, we need to be able to kind of have a way of describing how fast an object moves. In order to find our speed, we need to know a distance and we need to know time. If we know distance and time, we can figure out at least some part of speed. And down the bottom, you can see my nice little person here who's walking. And these are all the diff this is the speed that, that, um, that she's walking. 1.4 meters per second, or approximately 5 kilometers per hour. Um, the SI unit uh, is meters per second. But a lot of times, we're using other types of units. If we drive a car, we usually use miles per hour or kilometers per hour. Both of those are usually given on a speedometer in a car. So we can use lots of different units of speed. We always want to make sure that one of the units is a distance measurement and one is a time measurement because speed is calculated as distance divided by time. We also need to think about what we're measuring. If the object travels the same distance in the same time, then it's traveling at a constant speed. Most of the time, we're speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, right? You start off a race, you're really, really fast, and you're moving really fast, and then you slow down. But we usually, right, are not moving at a constant speed. So usually, instead of looking for um, kind of the speed at each little segment, we usually look for what's called the average speed. And we can look at speed in a couple different ways. We can use an equation, which we'll get to in a second, or we can graph it. And notice how the graph is set up. Time is along the x-axis. 
time is the independent variable, okay? The distance traveled is on the y-axis, and y, that distance is dependent. How far it goes depends on how much time has elapsed. So we start to see all these slopes as you kind of go through here. Here's the cruising jet, the speeding race car, water skier. Notice that the steeper that the slope is, then the faster that it's moving or the faster the speed is. Here we can calculate average speed. As I said, speed is distance divided by time. Usually instead of using an S for speed, we're also talking about velocity. Um, and velocity is the same thing, distance divided by time, only velocity is going to have a direction associated with it. So we're going to just use V equals D over T, and if you want to watch that video again, you are more than welcome to. So as I said, velocity gives us speed and direction. It tells us which direction we're moving and at what speed we're moving. Interesting thing is, if you are going at the same speed and change direction, you have a change in velocity. So it's either or or both. Any change in the speed, any change in direction, or in both is a change in velocity. So our velocity is changing an, a lot more than our speed all the time. We can also combine velocities to figure out kind of the overall velocity or the resultant velocity. Notice down here in this picture you have a, little, a guy who's walking on a bus. And he's walking up towards the driver, and he's walking in the same direction as the bus is moving. So he's moving about one meter per second east, and the bus is traveling at about 15 meters per second east. We can add these two together to get the resultant velocity. So 15 plus 1 meters per second east equals 16 meters per second east, giving us the resultant velocity. If, on the other hand, he's walking in the opposite direction, away or opposite from the direction that it's moving, so in this case I have 15 meters per second east, the bus is traveling, and I'm going to say plus negative 1 meters per second west. He's traveling in the opposite direction, so we're going to use a negative number to represent that. So in this case, he's actually traveling slower than the bus. The next part is acceleration. Acceleration is any change in velocity. No matter what it is, any change in velocity is considered to be acceleration. And it can be negative or positive. Down here you notice that the bike rider is kind of accelerating at one meter per second each second, going faster and faster. Acceleration, since it is velocity, changes with direction. Um, so you can constantly accelerate while never really speeding up or slowing down, um, as long as you change directions. And we see that an awful lot in circular motion. So if it's a uniform circular motion, you're going round and round and round and round and round again, you're constantly changing direction, so you are constantly accelerating. I also gave you the example of the Ferris wheel there. Um, I just want to go back one second and talk about acceleration and deceleration. These are terms that we use um, just so that we have an idea. We don't want to say, oh, it's negatively accelerating. Um, so we usually use acceleration to mean positive and deceleration to mean a negative or slowing down, speeding up and slowing down. But acceleration is actually any change. And we can calculate acceleration. And we use this equation down here, acceleration equals final velocity minus initial velocity over time. And any time we're looking at the change in velocity, we usually use the Greek symbol delta. So up here you'll see delta V. And delta V would equal final velocity minus initial velocity. Pretty much what is the change in velocity. So acceleration is the change in velocity over time. And in this case, we're using this acceleration equation for any straight line motion. So we're not talking about any other type of motion. And look, we can graph acceleration as well. We can use a velocity time graph. So notice we used time and distance before. This time, we can use time and velocity. And the slope is going to tell us the acceleration. In this case, since the velocity remained the same, there's no real acceleration, so acceleration is um, zero. 
meters per second squared. That's another thing for acceleration. Whenever you get your units, it's going to be distance divided by time divided by time. So notice that acceleration is in meters per second squared, while velocity is in meters per second. So that should give you a little clue when you're doing problems as to what it's talking about. The last part of this chapter talks about force. And force is pretty much anything that changes the state of rest or motion of an object. Anytime an object changes, either it comes to a rest or it moves or anything else, whatever what kind of force was there that was moving it is what it's going to be. So we have the force of the wall and the force of the car. They're going to come together. Probably not a really good thing to do. But we can have balanced forces or unbalanced forces. Um, balance forces means that they balance, balance each other or cancel each other out, right? So when you're pushing against your friend on ice skates and you're, you know, balancing your forces, if one of you happen to press harder than the other, you become unbalanced. And they're not going to completely cancel out each other, kind of like when you play tug of war. The idea is that you want an unbalanced force because you want to win. Get the other people stuck in the mud, right? When we talk about motion, we're also talking about another force, and it's the friction force. Um, friction always goes in the opposite direction of the motion. So whatever motion that you're, whatever way you're moving, friction is going to be in the opposite direction. And friction occurs at any time surfaces come in contact with each other. They're not smooth surfaces. There's always these little kind of hills and valleys, these little bumps. Even in the smoothest surface you can think of, there's, all, there's always these nice little kind of bumps and hills and valleys. So we start to see friction. And we can have a couple of different types of friction. If the force is at rest, it's considered to be static friction. If the objects are in motion, it's considered to be kinetic friction. You're going to see static and kinetic all the time, over and over and over again. Um, kinetic friction, lots of different types of friction when we're moving from one thing to another. Um, if we roll an object over a flat surface, we have what's called rolling friction. Um, rolling friction is usually less than sliding friction, which occurs when two things or two objects slide past each other. Um, don't forget about air also. Air actually has a force. Um, it's fluid friction. Um, don't forget air is a fluid. By the way, I know it's kind of a weird way of thinking about it. But um, air resistance and any time an object moves through any type of fluid, whether it's water in this case or air, we're going to encounter friction as well. Okay. One of the ways that we kind of reduce those, well, we use lubricants, right, especially like in cars, our motor oil and all, keep those moving, uh, moving parts from kind of... Um, bumping up against each other, heating up. Um, we can change friction types from like sliding to rolling. So we could do that um, as, you know, on my nice little elephant down here, we added some rolling friction instead of the sliding friction. So now we're able to push the elephant along. Um, swimmers and um, other type of racers usually try and make the surfaces smoother. Um, so that's why their, you know, uniforms and their bathing suits and all are designed for that, to help that, to reduce the amount of friction or drag. Um, there's other times when we want to increase friction, right? We don't want ice decreases friction on roads. We don't want that to happen. Otherwise, you know, we could slip and slide all over the road and it wouldn't be good. So we can make the surfaces rougher, adding ice, I mean, adding salt to it. We can also add sand. Um, Another way that we can increase helpful friction is to increase the forces that are pushing against the surfaces together, right? Up here, this is just a paperweight. If I don't want the paper to fly off the table, I'm going to put something heavy on top of it and increase the force pushing those two surfaces together. In that case, the paper and the um, table. We love friction. At least our cars love friction. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to make a car work. Um, so as the car's wheels turn, they push against the road. The road pushes back. That causes our car to accelerate. 
whole lot of other types of forces that are in 